Well, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, moderate for, moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. As always, we have a great webinar on tap, but before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded, so if you miss any or all of the event, you will have the opportunity to access the webinar later on, on demand. Following today's webinar, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And we are taking questions from the audience, so if at any time during today's presentation you have a question for either of our panelists, please don't wait, don't hesitate, just use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your questions, and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can near the end of today's webinar. Also, at the end of today's webinar, we are doing a drawing for six Amazon gift cards, each valued at $25. So please stick around. Hopefully, you'll be one of our six lucky winners. We'll also be doing uh, three quick polling questions near the end of today's webinar. So please uh, take a look out for those as well. All right, with that, we'll go ahead and kick off today's webinar, which is Detect, Debug, Deploy with CodeFresh and LightStep. Our speakers today are Austin Parker, who is Principal Developer Advocate at LightStep, and Guy Salton, who is Solution Architect at CodeFresh. Welcome, gentlemen. Thanks for joining me today. Guy, I know you are kicking off the conversation, and I know you got a great webinar on, uh, on tap, so I'm going to go ahead and put myself on mute and let you get ready. Great, thank you very much for the introduction. So yeah, my name is Guy. Um, I'm a solutions architect in CodeFresh and um, as Charlene mentioned, um, this webinar uh, is going to talk about um, how to easily detect um, any bugs or performance degradations in your deployment uh, as part of a CI CD cycle and then uh, we'll see how to yeah, easily detect these and then uh, fix them and uh, redeploy to fix any issues um, quickly. Um, so yeah, just a bit about myself. Um, I've been a solution architect um, with CodeFresh for uh, almost two, two years now, um, helping um, our customers um, with uh, demos, workshops, um, webinars, um, yeah, any any technical engagements. And you have my email um, address there, so uh, feel free to uh, ping me for any questions during the webinar or after, you also have the, the chat box, um, as mentioned, that, that you can use for questions and uh, we'll try to get to them um, during the webinar. Um, a bit, um, yeah, then Austin can introduce himself and then yeah, we'll continue. Yeah, so hi everybody, I'm Austin Parker. I'm Principal Developer Advocate at LightStep. Um, and, yeah, I'll be talking about the the role of observability in understanding your systems and how observability can help you sort of detect bugs and then as part of your CI CD process more quickly, you know, fix issues with your software and understand its performance. Really excited to show you all this demo today. I think Guy uh, yeah. wants to go through the yeah. agenda and tell you where you can find the code we'll be working on so you can follow along at home. Yeah, thanks, Austin. So, um, yeah, just to quickly go over the agenda for today's webinar, um, we'll start with a quick introduction on CodeFresh and, and LightStep and see what um, each of these platforms provides and, and what benefits you can get from using them. Um, then we'll talk a bit about uh, CI, CD in general, and then um, Austin will explain about the concept of observability. Um, and then we'll do a live demo um, where we would inspect some deployment, then um, fix some bug, and um, and redeploy um, using fully automated CI/CD pipelines. Um, as Austin mentioned, um, the uh, demo application that we're using is actually public in this GitHub repository, so you can feel free to, to follow along. Um, any of you guys who already uh, signed up to um, free account with CodeFresh and LightStep and have a Kubernetes cluster in hand. Um, you can really just um, try to follow along together with us during the webinar today. But of course, this webinar is recorded. Uh, you have the link to um, the application source code, so you can, uh, of course, do that afterwards. And so a bit about CodeFresh. Uh, CodeFresh is the first container native CI and CD platform uh, for microservices designed 
um, and build for Kubernetes. And so if you think about uh, more traditional CI platforms like Jenkins, for example, where you have to um, maintain you know, slaves, is build, node, build nodes, and, and then, um, you know, pre-install all the tools that you want to use um, on these nodes and make sure that you update them and maintain them. Uh, with CodeFresh, every step in the pipeline runs um, in a, a Docker container. So um, this really eases the, the management and maintenance of, of your pipelines. Um, you'll see also that in terms of, um, of UI and UX, that the platform is very, um, friendly and, and easy to use um, and um, yeah that, that's a bit about code fresh as you'll see everything during the demo yeah and so when you have you know continuous integration continuous delivery <clears throat> your system is changing a lot and the only way that you can really be confident in sort of the changes you're making is through a um, observability. Lightstep is an observability platform that allows you to analyze 100% of the requests uh, that move through your system. We can automatically detect regressions and deployments. We can perform aggregate analysis across, you know, millions or billions of requests per second to give you a real-time root cause analysis alerting, <clears throat> and it's all built on open source technologies like Open Telemetry. So there's no vendor lock-in. A little bit more about observability here, <clears throat> excuse me, because this might be, you know, you, you've probably heard of uh, CICD, you probably even heard about monitoring, but observability might be a new term. So just to introduce it, observability is kind of, it's not actually, you know, a piece of software, right? You you can't necessarily buy something that gives you observability. There are tools that can help you with it, but primarily observability is about how do you understand your system? How do you understand what your system is doing? And I pretty often get questions like, well, what's the difference between this and APM or what's the difference between this and monitoring? Um, you know, fundamentally, I believe that monitoring is very disconnected from the developer li development life cycle, right? Like monitoring is about saying, well, hey, here's some some key indicators we care about and we're just going, you know, if it, like RAM or CPU usage or um, request per second or error rate. And so if one of those numbers goes out of line, uh, you throw an alert and then some dev is getting a ticket to say like, well, why'd the error rate go up, right? And that's monitoring. Observability is about having uh, the ability to look at your entire system and really understand what correlated with that error rate going up, right? Um, or why did memory increase? It's about having all this information available and then being able to ask arbitrary questions about your system. And that's extremely powerful uh, when you combine that with CICD because it really saves you time and if if there's anything we could use more of these days, it's time, I think. So CICD, you know, as I said, speeds up your development velocity a lot, but that velocity has these trade-offs. And one pretty common sort of pattern uh, that I think we get into as, you know, developers or as, as DevOps people is you know, something changed, and a new feature was released, and that had an impact on performance. But why did it have an impact on performance, right? A lot of times these systems are very disconnected from each other, or the person or people that are pushing changes maybe aren't the people that are responsible for, you know, ensuring uptime or ensuring reliability. So you need this combination of tools. You need ways for uh, the code to change quickly, but you also need and observability tools to understand what is happening as a result of those changes. So there's sort of a prerequisite for this, right? And it's instrumentation. Um, instrumentation is a way that you modify your source code and you modify your service to emit telemetry data. Now, one pretty common concern or complaint or, or something you hear a lot is like, oh, I, I can't get developers to, you know, instrument their code. Uh, people don't want to, 
you know, be locked into some proprietary tool, uh, some proprietary APM tool or whatever in order to understand performance. Well, this is where things like OpenTelemetry come in. So OpenTelemetry is a vendor neutral project um, managed out of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, CNCF, and it is a vendor neutral API and SDK for generating telemetry. Now, one really cool thing it offers is this idea of automatic instrumentation. So if you're familiar with agents, you know, agent-based instrumentation approaches, open telemetry, you know, the, the, the biggest idea here is that a lot of companies, a lot of vendors will provide these to you, but they're fairly undifferentiated, right? They're fairly similar in what they do. You know, they'll, if you've got, you know, Express or Spring or some, you know, some popular framework, they will find that code, they will add in some hooks around it, and they will, you know, instrument that so that you can see the performance. But there doesn't need to be like 10 different options, right? You shouldn't have to juggle multiple different types of agents in order to <clears throat> inspect your services. You know, you shouldn't have to, you know, maybe your company acquires another company or you have a new product you're integrating and then they used vendor X and you use vendor Y. And so now you have this big integration problem. Um, or you have an issue where it's like, oh, I can't, you know, I have to go between five or six different tools in order to see one request as it kind of moves through these heterogeneous systems. Open Telemetry is seeking to kind of do away with that by providing a single, uh, well documented, highly supported, you know, set of auto instrumentation tools for all the languages that it supports. So today I want to kind of show you something, you know, a, a sort of a real world scenario here, right? Um, let's assume that we have an application and we've already, you know, this, this is an application that's running in Kubernetes. We've already got CI CD set up. Um, we're using Helm to deploy it and someone pushes a new feature. So let's switch over here and take a look at our app. So the first place I want to start out is kind of in CodeFresh, actually. Um, and this is just to show the the build and how this application is being pushed. So we have a fairly straightforward um, pipeline here. And if I can jump into it. Yeah, did the same thing twice. But either way, we're cloning our code from GitHub. We're building these two Docker images, one for a client, one for a server, and then pushing those to Docker Hub. And then we're deploying a Helm chart. Yeah. Uh, by the way, Austin, can you click on the um, Docker build step, one of these um, ones? Um, just to just to note that if you can scroll a bit up on the logs, you'll see that um, yeah, CodeFresh has a built-in step for building Docker images, and it has built-in um, Docker image caching as well as distributed layer caching. So you'll see there in the logs, as this is not the first time Austin ran this this build, is that it automatically reuses, you see it says using cache, um, reusing any existing layers of the image from the cache, and then only builds the new layers. Um, so mm -hmm. there's a lot of like caching optimizations um, that can really reduce um, yeah, the time of, of your builds. Um, and it's all built in, like you, you don't really have to do anything about that. Yeah. And I can actually look at how this is all configured. Um, we're we're kind of doing a, you know, code first or infrastructure as code process here. So my actual build configuration is all contained within a YAML file. Um, <clears throat> you can see this in, if you're following along in the GitHub repo, you can actually see this file. And there's some stuff in here that's kind of uh, like some of this metadata we're setting. These are sort of just like demonstration images uh, or, or values in the real world. You would probably want to put, you know, your own tags here. And we'll look a little later at what these actually mean or how you can see these in the CodeFresh UI. But we have a bunch of uh, values kind of configured here. And what this lets us do is this lets us use CodeFresh as sort of a one-stop shop for 
uh, looking at our environments, looking at our application. So here, for example, is the environment that my uh, application has been deployed to. I can see that it's deployed. I can actually really quickly jump to that recent build. And if I click on this, I see my application. So this is you know, a pretty simple um, to-do app. So, but there's a problem and it's right here that uh, I'm supposed to be getting a cat fact every time I look at my to-dos because I, along with the rest of the internet, love cats. And I wanna look at cat facts when I'm looking at my to-do list. So I see that some cats are throwing exceptions, which isn't really what we want. So let's add a to-do here and get that sent in. So we know that our application is broken somehow, right? We know that some cats are throwing exceptions. Um, let's switch over and look at the actual code. So here's my uh, application, just to kind of walk you through it real quick. Again, here's my code for SGAML. I have three directories I really care about. I have my Helm chart, um, which is the responsible for deploying the application to Kubernetes. I have the server code and the client code. So let's look for that exception. It's right over here. So I can see that I'm, I'm getting an exception somewhere in this, but what if I you know, didn't have access to this entire application? What if I was kind of, what if I didn't even have, no, what if I wasn't able to actually like jump to this one exception? I might say, well, okay, you know, it was a little slow kind of doing some things there. There's, there's some exceptions happening. I don't have the data I really need to understand what's going on. Maybe I could go pull the logs and look at that. But if this was, you know, you can imagine a more complicated application that's distributed across you know, many, many, many containers. What if it's only one of these containers that's having a problem, right? Looking at logs is gonna be hmm, time consuming to say the least. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use open telemetry and LightStep to quickly understand what's going on in my code. Uh, this is all documented in the readme if you wanna follow along, but basically we're gonna start by adding the open telemetry instrumentation for Java to um, Austin, if I can just stop you there for, uh, for a second. Yeah, we, we had yeah. We got a question on our uh, question box, um, which was yep. what the Helm chart. So maybe just a, um, a few words about Helm. Helm is a package yeah. manager for, for Kubernetes. Um, so if you are like migrating to Kubernetes, looking at Kubernetes, uh, you should definitely check out Helm. It's, a, it's an open source project that lets you treat multiple Kubernetes manifest like a deployment YAML, ingress YAML, service YAML, all is like a single entity. And it also has built-in capabilities uh, for version control over um, versions of your release. So it makes it very easy to roll back to previous versions and we'll see some of these capabilities in today's webinar. Um, so yeah, just check out um, yeah, Helm project. Um, it's, um, yeah, it's very, very useful for deploying applications to Kubernetes. Yeah. Um, so while we were talking about that, I what I've done is I've added a couple things to my Docker file here for my server. Um, and the, for, for, I'm downloading two jars. Uh, this is the Open Telemetry Java instrumentation. And what this is, this is really two components. It's a uh, one that kind of instruments the application for me, and then another one that lets me export data. So I add both of those to my Docker file, and then during the build, it will go and download these. And then I'm setting a, an environment variable in the container, which is the name of the service, um, which I'm gonna call to do server. This could be over, you can override this, um, but I'm setting a default just because it needs one to work. And then in my entry point down here, I'm adding a couple of uh, flags for the JVM. So I'm passing a Java agent flag and I'm telling it use otel.jar, which we've set up right here. And then I'm giving it sort of a default endpoint for a collector. Um, and I'm also telling it what exporter jar to use. Now, 
if I run this, what will happen is um, without me having to edit any of the code in my Java application, it will automatically go through and at application startup, it will look and uh, look for things that can instrument, right? So this is a Spring application. Um, we're using Spring Boot, you know, and Spring Boot is responsible for re really kind of setting up all of the, the servlet containers and, and all the other, you know, making it an HTTP service. It's responsible for um, kind of talking to MySQL and, and setting up a data repository for our, again, pretty simple to-dos. So without me having to change any of this stuff, just by adding OpenTelemetry into the Docker file, I'm going to get sort of traces um, for every request that come in, that comes in. But I need to send those somewhere. So the next thing we need to do is we need to add a collector. And the collector is going to be, I'm going to skip a step actually we're going to go to the collector first so the collector is there's there's a lot of yaml i'm about to throw in here and i don't want to i'm not going to explain it all just because there's a lot of it but what the collector is it's a process that can collect and aggregate trace and metric data from multiple other processes and then export it to a back end service for later analysis. So in this case, the thing we can actually care about is this uh, config map, which has a collector config. And this is telling it to do a few different things. One, it's saying, uh, here's a receiver for open telemetry protocol. So this is the wire format for uh, telemetry data from open telemetry. It's registering a couple of extensions and processors, and this is stuff like, hey, batch these. As, as data comes in, batch it to go out. Um, make it so you can like retry to send stuff. We also add in a health check and then Z pages, which is for diagnostic information about the collector itself. And then we're setting up three exporters. So our Prometheus exporter is so that we can export metrics about the collector or about our applications to Prometheus, and that will be listening on port 8889. We also have a logging exporter, so this is just going to put information in standard out, and then we're setting up a LightStep exporter in order to set send data to LightStep. We register all those in the service section, and then that's that's pretty much it. There's uh, the rest of this is just exposing ports, um, telling the uh, the collector where to live and where to be available from, and other various Kubernetes things that needs to happen. So there's one other part of this that we might care about, right? We've we've got our server instrumented, we've got a collector for that data, but what about the front end? Now. This is a Vue.js single page application. And um, the nice thing about that is everything kind of runs in the browser, right? Like I'm not a, you know, the if I look at the Docker file here, actually, it's pretty lightweight. We're just taking the compiled version of our app and then we're putting it behind Nginx and then throwing it in a container and saying, hey, you know, expose port 80. Yeah, by the so, way, I uh, noticed that, um, yeah, we're using a, a multi-stage Docker file. Um, yeah. So yeah, in production, you don't want to have all the uh, build tools and um, and unnecessary um, yeah uh, tools. Um, you only want like the most like lightweight container um, that would be both secure and uh, lightweight, so it would be fast to to deploy and also yeah more secure. Yeah. So what I'm uh, going to need to do is. <clears throat> I also need to add OpenTelemetry to this client application. Uh, thankfully, there's auto instrumentation for Java, but there's also automatic instrumentation for JavaScript, even in JavaScript in the browser. So if I go and I, I look back a section here, there's two parts to adding OpenTelemetry to our client. The first is going to be adding some dependencies to our package.json. So let's pull these over. 
and add them to the dependency section here. The second thing I'm going to need to do is I'm going to need to create a new um, file. I'm going to call this tracer.js. And we're going to imp take this section of code and paste it in there. And I'll explain what it does. So what tracer.js is doing is it is um, importing all of our open telemetry libraries and configuring them. This is some of the stuff that, you know, kind of behind the scenes on that Java side is being done for you. Uh, with the nature of JavaScript, like this was kind of how they decided to do automatic instrumentation um, since, well, it's usually a little bit easier to add files, I guess, to JS. But we don't actually have to touch our existing code really at all here. We're creating a exporter for to the collector, and then we're creating this web tracer provider and adding these plugins to it. One for document load, one for user interaction, and one for XML HTTP request. So what these will do when I take this file and I import it, which I will do over here in main, as you can see, we've actually already got it done. If this tracer module <clears throat> is the first thing imported into the application bundle, then it will look and automatically hook into XML HTTP requests. It'll hook into sort of DOM loading and all that other good stuff and automatically create telemetry for me based off of it. So I don't actually have to go in, you know, I don't have to go into this API component, this API module and add in instrumentation code here. I just get it for free by configuring it in my tracer.js. So with that done, um, I'm technically ready. I'm technically ready to go. But there is one other thing that we can do that is maybe interesting. Because you know it's nice to have sort of that automatic instrumentation, but there's there's some stuff that maybe I would still, you know. At the end of the day, we're all humans, right? We're all people trying to understand our software. And there's only so much that, you know, this sort of automatic instrumentation these agents can do for you. So if I look at this, if I go back to where we started and I go back to um, kind of this exception, I see that this is able to throw some exceptions. And I'm, I'm not doing, you know, best practices here. I'm not actually getting that exception out uh, in a way that I can easily understand it. So is there a way that open telemetry can make this a little easier for me? And thankfully the answer is yes. So if I, <coughs> excuse me, gosh, it's dry here today. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna import something from um, open telemetry auto instrumentation, which is this uh, annotation called with span. Now I also need to go into Gradle and I need to add a dependency. So we're gonna grab this automatic annotation uh, library as well. And what this lets us do, this gives us access to the with span annotation. And what that does is whenever the automatic instrumentation is going through and it's uh, looking for things to instrument, it's looking for code and libraries that it can hook into, it's going to see this, this annotation here and it's going to say, okay, I also want to um, create a new span around this work, right? Because I know as a person that's writing this code, this is probably where the problem is. Uh, well, technically, I explicitly know what the problem is because I'm the one that wrote the bug. But I can tell, like, okay, this is most likely something interesting is happening here, and I want to specifically see this one part. So with all of that done, let's we would go in. You know, we would add a commit for adding open telemetry. Uh, commit, and then I'm actually not going to push this one because 
I don't want to push that to the base copy. But let's pretend we did. So, and then let's go back over to our browser. Now, while I'm doing this, if anyone has any questions um, about the specifics of what we're doing, feel free to sort of ask them uh, in real time. Uh, we can stop and you know try to answer them. If you have any more general questions, we will leave some time uh, at the end here in about 15 minutes that you can ask them. So let's pretend that you know I push all that code, my application's running, great. I want to see what's going on. So I'm going to switch over to LightStep. Now, LightStep, as I said before, you know, this is a tool for observability. This is a tool for understanding what's going on in your, your application. So what I'm seeing <clears throat> is quite a bit of data, actually. Um, I can see, you know, here's from the client, you know, here's all the P50 latency, here's errors, here's operation rate. Basically, here's the, all the key operations of our, our client-side app. Um, here's where it's going and getting to-dos. Here's where it's going and getting facts from the backend server. I can also see from the service perspective, you know, what are the key operations here? And there's a lot of stuff. Um, I can, you know, this repository, you know, getting repository. This is a sort of spring one. Here's a options request. But then I can see some other things here too. This is a SQL statement, right? I can see actual, you know, SQL queries and operations being done by Spring to my backend database, which is really cool. So that helps me kind of understand, you know, at a high level. But let's let's drill down and actually try to find our specific problem. So this is our the Explorer, and this is where I can really start to dig into my data. So I know that my problem is over in that to-do server, and uh, we actually pre-populate, you know, some key operations here. So I can, and I know that f slash fact is the endpoint that is having the problem. So when I filter down, I can see that we have two here. So let's click on this one. And see what's going on. So what I've got is a trace of the entire request from beginning to end. Um, this is from the view application up here. Um, you can see to do client XML HTTP request. This is where it was trying to go fetch uh, slash fact on the server. And then I can see here's where we're going from kind of one method to the other. This is where it's being handled, and then it's going into the controller. And then this is the method, uh, the get catfact method that I had put that annotation on that we just saw. And over here, I can see that we have these tags that show, oh, there's here's my stack trace, right? I can see it can't construct an instance, cannot deserialize an object value. And then here's kind of this full um, stack trace. And I can see like, the specific type of the error. Now I note that um, OpenTelemetry is still in beta, so some of this is showing up maybe in a place you wouldn't expect, like these, like this would presumably be a log rather than a tag. But you know, again, beta software. I can also view kind of detailed information about the specific operation, so I can see like, well, how long did you know for the entire sort of request? Uh, what was the contribution of this one particular span to that overall latency? Looks like 6.29 milliseconds, which wasn't a ton. So, with that said, it's like, oh, okay. I now I know what my you know problem is. If I switch back over to here, I can actually go back into a cat facts. And the problem is that there it's missing a constructor app. So we'll add cat facts, super. We'll do another. Whoops. 
save that and then we will stage and push push on the one you can't see and now let's jump back into code fresh So what I've done is I just went and pushed the fix. And you can see in my build here that we are cloning, we are building, and then we will start deploying here in a moment. Yep, so um, we had um, a Git trigger attached to the pipeline. And then um, once um, Austin made the change in, in the repo, this automatically triggered the pipeline. And then you see that it's running. Uh, one cool thing that you can note is, uh, Austin, if you click on the initializing process box there, um, you'll see that what we do to share data between steps is um, because every step runs, runs the container, we provision a volume, a persistent volume for each pipeline, and we then mount this volume to each container that runs as part of the pipeline. So you see that as this is not the first time the build is running, it says that it's actually reusing a volume. So um, the first time the pipe pipeline ran, it downloaded uh, all necessary dependencies and, and performed um, all kinds of steps like that, like loading the repo and all that stuff. And then the next time the pipeline runs, um, all of the, like the, the, the same volume is, is used again. So um, you don't really need to download the dependencies again if you know you already did that in the previous execution so the the, the second pipe the second build and and onwards will just run uh, uh, much much faster and it will also be able to utilize all these um, caching optimizations that i mentioned earlier yeah cool um we can also so while that's deploying let's take a second to look at some more stuff in code fresh so i, I mentioned earlier you know, CodeFresh is able to kind of keep track of these images for me. And so I can actually see here, here's, you know, uh, that to-do server that I just built. So you can see, here's those annotations that we had on there. You know, this, you can actually link back to other systems, you know, other integrations you might have, like with Jira or whatever. I can look yeah. at, you know, the Git SHA that this came from. I can- mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is actually- image. Yeah. Pretty powerful, especially the, the code section, I think, because um, as you have both CI and CD capabilities in the same platform, um, you can trace back the changes from this image that is already deployed to your Kubernetes cluster all the way back to the GitHub repo to see the exact commit and change that the developer made, Austin in this case, and that eventually built and, and deployed this image. So um, mm -hmm. if you ever wondered, for Kubernetes deployment, especially in the microservices world where you probably deploy multiple times a day, you know, for this specific deployment, does it include my latest commit or it doesn't? So here you just have this traceability uh, built in. And uh, just one note on the annotations. Um, if you note that, you notice that um, Austin showed that in the, in the YAML uh, at the beginning, um, you can just add a condition. So let's say you run your unit test as part of your Docker file. Um, so once you run the Docker build test, um, the Docker build step, this actually runs your unit test, and then you can just um, add like a condition saying, if this build step passed successfully, then I know that the unit test already also passed. So I can just add like a quality annotation to my image and, and, and add any metadata as annotations. And this way I can then identify which images has passed some tests or security scans, for example, and which hasn't. And I can nicely see this in a visual representation in, in the platform as well. Yeah. Um, so let's actually switch over here and look at our environment again. So you see we have our new build for fix cat, fix cat fact. Um, now, hopefully, I believe this is it. Yeah, so we can see that, you know, we can actually look at the Helm interface here. We can see that our uh, build was deployed and we can jump in and actually get a lot of information about what is all exactly in here. So, like I said earlier, um, 
you know, we're using MySQL and you can actually see, you know, here's our MySQL image. We can see the health of these. You know, here's my Prometheus um, containers that are also being deployed with it. And I can see my to-do client, my to-do server down here. I can also look at the history. Uh, one thing that we're not going to really show off in this demo, but um, if you want to find our last one where we showed this off, uh, there's a really powerful rollback feature in CodeFresh where you can, like, I could click this here. Like, let's say that, you know, maybe I deployed instrumentation um, and I had a bug or maybe the instrumentation didn't work quite right and I want to really quickly go back to what I just had. I can just click this rollback and go back to the last uh, successful release or the last or whatever release I want to roll back to without mm -hmm. having to kind of do a whole bunch of, you know. And you can you can even click on just anywhere in, in one of these version boxes, Austin, right? And it, and it, it yeah. will show you, yeah, this is the current version, but if you click on any previous version, it will show you which files have changed. Like in this case, um, uh, none of these files have changed, but it will show you what was yeah. the actual change. And then um, you can easily roll back yeah, to any specific version. And this, by the way, uh, relates to this initial question we got from the audience about what is a Helm chart. So um, this capability of CodeFresh is actually built on um, the, the built-in capability of Helm for, um, for, for built-in rollback and, and version control. So that's why, yeah, we, we usually recommend using Helm for Kubernetes deployments. Yeah, it's really great. So let's, it's been a few minutes now. So let's, uh, let's check our application out. Let's see if we have cat facts. So we're loading, we're loading. And look at that. We, we have a cat fact. Cat fanciers bred and exhibited mouse in Europe until World War II and attention towards the cat waned and it nearly went extinct. I don't know what that is. After humans, the lines have the largest range of any mammal in the Western hemisphere. Cool. So I think we fixed our application. Uh, let's clear that out. And we have a few minutes left here. So let's actually jump back into LightStep and kind of show you the difference and show you, you know, some of the other stuff that you can do with observability because, you know, yay, we fixed the bug, right? Great. That's, that's now everyone that comes to use our CatFact app will be able to see their cat facts in peace. Um, but there's some other interesting things here that, you know, maybe I don't want to know today, but I want to know tomorrow, right? Or I, I have might have questions about later. So just looking at that fact endpoint, we can actually see some interesting behavior in the durations of our, you know, how long is it taking? Because if you recall that first time I went and hit that endpoint, like the first time after the deployment, like it took a minute. It took like a note, like noticeable amount of time for this uh, fact to appear. So I can see like, well, here's a 1.72 seconds. You know, why did it take that long? Well, it looks like the majority of that time was actually being spent in this get to my remote server. So that um, looks like almost 50% of the latency uh, on that cold start was, you know, actually going and getting something from my remote endpoint. And then on subsequent ones, you know, it's much faster. So maybe I would, you know, maybe someone's looking and it's like, hey, why is it so slow every now and then? And this would actually let me see that it's not actually something in my code at all. Just looking at the behavior, it seems that this external API, um, whenever it cold starts, has a longer, you know, wake up time. So now I've been able to, you know, now I can kind of say, it's like, oh, well, you know, this is the, this is the actual problem. And then there's so much more that you can do with this data. Like I said, we only really added one kind of custom thing, but I want to just explore some of what you're getting for free here. Um, if I go and I look at the client, and run a query. So I can see all sorts of these operations here. So I can, uh, let's maybe filter to the document load. So I can see each time I'm loading, I can look, you know, how long did it take for kind of each of my, uh, each of the components to load, right? I needed to fetch the document. 
um, here's my CSS bundle, my JavaScript, you know, what's taking the longest amount of time, right? And then I can actually even see like of this individual operation, what, how long did it take for certain things to happen? So, you know, looks like we had two milliseconds between the connection getting set up and then request. So I, yeah, again, I'm getting a lot of like really detailed timing information about, um, I went from fetching my content, the DOM became interactive 73 milliseconds later. And this again is something that I was able to configure with really one line of code. Let's look at the server because, you know, maybe I'm a backend dev and I want to know like, hey, well, what's, uh, what's the performance of a certain repository, right? Or a certain SQL query. So here's that find all operation. And this is going to only run once when I start up the app. But I can actually see here, you know, this is just the SQL query itself. This is like that database statement. So if I wanted to, you know, you can you can sort of see in a world where I've got a lot of different queries or a lot of, you know, certainly more operations, more stuff happening than this in this small demo, you know, I'm able to look at one specific query and then see how long is that taking over time? You know, is the performance of that query getting better or worse? Uh, how does that change as the parameters are different? There's quite a bit of interesting performance data I can kind of tease out here. You know, and then I can even say like, well, hey, just what's what's slow, right? And see, eh, here's my you know top five, ten percent, let's say, of slow requests. And a lot of this is probably like it's a cold, you know, the container was starting cold, so there's you know some additional overhead in in spring doing stuff. Like if I come back and kind of refresh this a bunch. Cats dislike citrus scents. And then come back into light step. Give it a second. And then let's group by HTTP method. And so now I can, you know, now I'd be able to look and say like, oh, okay, well, for get, here's my average latency for all get requests. And then I can um, look at the specific ones, kind of drill down in. I can go up here and look at, you know, if I had more data, I can look at um, what's correlated highly with these requests with a higher tail latency. Yeah, a little bit more. And I could see, like, eh, maybe it's this one particular user agent, right? I mean, it's all going to be my user agent, but. Here's a good one. Uh, application filter chain so again i can i can really dive into see what my individual components are doing see what is contributing to kind of performance issues in my app and you know really just kind of explore and understand what's going on and that i think is again kind of the key of observability right it's it's having all this information available to you in order to understand what's going on with your service understand what's going on in your application and then you know be able to detect things that are happening uh find them fix them and then using tools like codefresh using codefresh you know quickly and easily deploy those changes So, um, yeah, yes, uh, if you... thank you yeah, very much, um, Austin, for, for the demo. So, um, yeah, as we've seen, um, CodeFresh um, uh, can really make it easier for you to, uh, to create those pipelines for containerized applications and, and deploy your application to Kubernetes. And 
um, it's um, we have built-in steps um, for these deployments, so um, you you don't really need to worry about starting like to create some bash scripts or any custom scripts to handle the deployments or any other steps. Like we have all of these built-in steps that that you can use, um, and and as Austin showed, it, it's very important as part of CI CD, especially to um, not on, not only be able to respond fast and 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 um, and deploy fast, but also to identify easily when um, there are any bugs or performance degradations, so you know that you know your users are are getting in, in like a bad version of the application, so you. Uh, be able to easily fix and and redeploy. Um, yeah, we have some some questions. Um, uh, Austin, one question here is um, how is this different from Zipkin? Um, good good question. Thank you. So it's built on uh, so LightSip as a platform also it can integrate uh, metric data like host metrics and infrastructure metrics to give you sort of a unified picture of observability about your services. But fundamentally, you know, LightSep is built on distributed tracing, um, which is what Zipkin is, you know, Zipkin is a distributed trace analyzer. We actually can accept data from Zipkin if you want to see the difference. Uh, the functions that are showing, like being able to filter and group by tags, being able to see what's correlated um, between, you know, certain operations and you know saying like you, you I didn't really show it a ton in this demo but you can imagine you know if I had you know a thousand requests per second or something and they were all from different sort of hosts or whatever then I could use that correlations feature to say like okay well for my kind of long tail latency for my slowest five percent of requests what do they have in common right are they all from a particular region are they all hitting one container or another you know, and sort of that automated um, insights into what's going on uh, through heuristics, like that's what LightStep, I think, really differentiates itself with compared to something like Zipkin. You know, Zipkin's fine for sort of analyzing individual traces and doing a little bit of anal you know, group analysis on them, but we really shine on that sort of, you know, taking in 100% of your trace data and then analyzing it at, uh, in real time and giving you insights for, you know, if you're trying to do firefighting or something like that. All right, guys, it's about eight minutes to the top of the hour. I think we have time for one more question that I see here in the queue. Is it possible to introduce tracing without polluting code with tracing related statements? It's not easy to convince to adopt uh, due to presence of non-core logic. So is there another way and what are the best practices? Um, yeah, also a good question. I mean, I, I, I mean, yes. Like I feel like the demo was uh, trying to be extremely not adding trace, you know, like you don't have to add, you know, you, you, I didn't have to add that annotation right but if you look at the back end from the java side at least like i added like two lines of actual code um one import statement and then one annotation on a method so <clears throat> for things like java or c sharp like it's very easy to add this stuff in and have it be mostly invisible and not have to add in anything else um on the javascript side sort of the same deal like Yes, there was tracing code, but it wasn't really polluting anything else. Um, it depends on the language. Like if you're using, let's say you're using Go. Okay, you're going to have to have uh, tracing code. You're going to have to add in tracing code in Go. You know, even with um, some of the automatic instrumentation options and the library wrappers that exist in Go, like you're still going to have to change, you know, you're going to have to pass a different argument um, or, or wrap your HTTP handler in a tracing wrapper in order to get traces. Like, it's just not, as a language, it's not really built in the same way that like C Sharp or Java is, and you can't do all the fun bytecode manipulation tricks. Um, but in, you know, in managed things like Java or C Sharp, uh, in dynamic languages like Python, um, it's super easy to add in very, you know, lightweight um, auto instrumentation that kind of 
rewrites, pro, you know, prototypes or, or adds instrumentation automatically um, at runtime or at build time in order to avoid this complaint about quote unquote polluting the code base tracing code. That said, mm-hmm. like, do people complain about polluting the code base with the log statements? Like, I, I sort of challenge the fundamental assumption here that tracing code is somehow like less worthwhile, right? We observability, you know, like telemetry isn't a nice to have, it's a requirement. If you want to know what your application is doing, you need to add code to it. And developers at some point are going to have to, like, we we need to combat the assumption that like, oh, this is some extra thing that is heavy and and opaque or oblique or whatever. Like, you, you have to be able to understand what your code is doing and you have to be able to add in statements in the correct places to get that information. So I'd be happy to talk more about this um, with whoever asked the question offline. Um, my email is right there, or you can find me on Twitter at Austin L. Parker. All right, great. So um, real quick, guys, before we, we're going to have to close out the question and answer period now, but before we uh, get to our Amazon gift card drawing, I do have three quick polls that I want to go ahead and launch out to you guys. Uh, Here's the first one coming. Uh, Did this webinar meet expectations? Go ahead and submit your answers. Then we'll get on to uh, the next two polling questions. All right, looks like we are ready to go ahead and uh, close this one out here in about five seconds. So, okay, all right, we're gonna go ahead and close this one out and let's take a look at the second one launching now. Do you want to try Code Fresh? Go ahead and make your selection and then we'll go ahead and uh, close this one out after about 30 seconds and then we'll do the last one. Then we'll do the drawing for the six $25 Amazon gift cards. So stay tuned for that guys. All right, we're closing in on 30 seconds. So we're gonna go ahead and close it out now. Uh, three, two, one, okay. All right, and here's our, our final polling question coming out now. Do you want to try light step? So go ahead and make your final selection here. Then we'll go ahead and close this out after 30 seconds, get to that drawing and let everybody get on with their day. So while we are waiting, I do want to thank everybody who did submit questions. There were some really great questions. If we didn't get to it, uh, get to your question, please know that the folks at Lightstep and Codefresh are getting a copy of the questions. So they'll be more than happy to follow up with you offline. So in addition to um, to Guy and Austin. So, all right, let's go ahead and close this polling question out. And uh, before we close things down, do want to do that drawing for the six $25 Amazon gift cards. So without further ado, our winners today are uh, Carlos. Congratulations, Carlos. Uh, Daniel G, congratulations, Daniel. Uh, Felipe F, congratulations, Felipe. Marvin W, congratulations, Marvin. Roberto S, congratulations, Roberto. And finally, Jerry P, congratulations, Jerry. Guys, check your inbox. We'll be reaching out to you via email to get your gift card over to you. So um, like I said, check your inbox for the information there. I do want to remind the audience that today's event has been recorded, so if you missed any or all of the event, or if you just want to watch it again, you will have the opportunity to do so. Uh, We will be sending out an email uh, after the event that does contain a link to access the webinar on demand. The webinar is also going to be living on the DevOps.com website, so you can always go find it there. Just go to DevOps.com slash webinars, look in the on demand section, and it should be right there waiting for you. Uh, Guy and Austin, thank you so much for a great presentation. As always, such good information. And judging from the quality of the questions we got, I know was very well received by the audience. So thanks again. Appreciate that. Also want to thank Yes. I uh, also want to thank the audience for joining me today. This is Charlene O'Hanlon, and I'm now signing off. Have a great day, everybody. Stay safe.